The first question this week comes from Wes, and he asks, high volume versus high intensity. The classic debate, which is better for gains? Lower volumes, higher intensity. So when I say higher intensities, I'm thinking that you mean higher relative intensities. So like lower volumes and training really close to failure versus higher volumes and maybe leaving a couple of reps in the tank is what I'm assuming. Because a program that I think that would be dog shit, shit for hypertrophy would be low volumes, high absolute intensities. Something like doing a three sets of two or something like that on the squat. I think that would be very not good for hypertrophy. But lower volumes, higher relative intensities, training to failure compared to higher volumes, lower relative intensities. I am very much so in the camp of using higher volumes and I don't even want to say low relative intensities. Like I think that each set should be hard and each set should be close to failure. Each set, I think maybe within three reps from failure is probably a pretty good approach, which is still a challenging set. And the reason I think this is twofold. For one, it aligns with my anecdotal experience with it. Like I personally took the approach for a long time, like probably several months to a year to where I stayed probably around seven to 10 sets per week and per muscle for my major muscle groups. My arms was probably less, probably like three to six direct sets a week. And so lower volumes relatively, but I took everything to failure and I got stronger, but really my physique didn't improve a ton. It really didn't. Now, could have I done better things with my diet? Absolutely. I think that the, the approach I took with my diet during that time was more of an intermittent fasting approach to where I basically ate two meals per day and probably not optimal regarding muscle mass and stuff like that. So there's definitely confounding variables. It was at the start of college, so my sleep wasn't as good. So there's a lot that goes at play there. So I don't want you to think that, you know, my anecdotal experience with that style of training is going to be the typical response because there's other things going on in my life to make it a little atypical. And, you know, maybe if I did a higher volume approach during that time, I wouldn't have saw great results either. I think that could very well be the case. All right, but what I do know is that when I transitioned from that approach to more so starting around eight to 10 sets and working myself up, and later on, there's a question that is right along with my current training split, which I haven't really explained, and I'll kind of go over that a little bit. But when I started working from eight to 10 sets and then scaling that up, I saw a lot better results. And my my approach to reps and reserve, I personally tend to stay around one to two reps in reserve most of the time. When I start a mesocycle, I do my best to keep two or three reps in reserve, but even I trade like a jackass. So I tend to stop a set when I get to the point of, all right, I could probably get one, maybe two more reps here. And I kind of stick with that throughout the most of my mesocycle. Now, in the latter, in my final weeks or my final week, I'll take more of my isolation stuff, less systemically fatiguing stuff to all out failure to where I actually fail a rep. But man, I, I think that I think that staying around one to two reps in reserve just gets you such a good ratio of kind of stimulus to fatigue to where that set, in my opinion, is going to be almost as stimulative as taking a set to all out failure. But man, a set to all out failure, for me anyways, fatigues me 
way more than leaving a rep or two in the tank. And for those reasons, I'm able to accumulate a lot more volume and a lot more recoverable volume and have a lot more productive sessions and get a lot more quality volume in each session. I notice that when I leave a rep or two in the tank, my following sets are better. I'm my mind muscle connection on my following sets are better. My mind muscle connection throughout the rest of my training sessions are better. Everything's a little bit better when I leave a couple of reps in the tank. And, you know, even in like the last week of my program, I personally would prefer to do a little bit more volume rather than taking sets to like all out failure and beyond. Just me personally. Now, some people think that there's still benefits to taking things like to all, all out failure in that last week. I think that's a reasonable approach. I have used that with clients and they see good results. And the approach I use with clients depends on the client. Like some clients are a little bit more like me towards like worse. <laughs> the best you're going to get out of me is like two reps in reserve. Okay, well, we can work with that. First two weeks of the program, one to two reps in reserve. Second, last two weeks. Okay, we'll go zero to one. That's still managing fatigue pretty well. And we can still accumulate quite a bit of volume doing that. And I think that the benefits of more quality volume, more recoverable volume, improved session quality because you're not as taxed. Now, if you always train to failure, well, you're probably going to get used to that a little bit. And your session quality might struggle at first and then it might get better over time because you are getting used to training to failure like that. So maybe if you always train a failure like that, maybe that's less of a reason to, or that's going to be less detrimental. All right. But I think that the benefits of more recoverable volume, higher quality volume per session outweighs the potential benefits of going to all out failure. However, There's a pretty big individual response in how people respond to volume. And I think that there's going to be people that very well respond quite a bit better to 7 to 10 sets per muscle per week rather than 15 to 18 sets on average. Like if you think about, I think the example that everybody uses a little bit is... Jeff Alberts, where his volumes are relatively low, but he's also a pretty high responder. And I think that even the research tends to support that low responders, if you don't respond very well to lifting or whatever it might be, okay, we might actually have to use a higher training dose, which kind of makes sense. If you're a little bit more resistant to the anabolic stimulus of lifting weights, it might make sense that you might need a little bit more stimulus to drive adaptation. And it seems as though people that are high responders are the ones that tend to respond a little bit better to the kind of lower volume, higher intensity approach. And if they're already good responders, then are they responding well because of the high intensity or are they responding well because they would regardless? And maybe they would respond even better to doing... 15, 20% more volume, but leaving a rep or two in the tank. Maybe. But, I don't know. At the end of the day, I think both can work. And if you don't enjoy your training, I don't care how optimal it is on paper, you know. Well, okay. There's trade-offs that we're going to have to accept between what's optimal on paper and what we enjoy. Like, if you're telling me you want to be a world-class bodybuilder and but you don't enjoy your training that I think is optimal for you and you're responding really well to it, well then suck it up and do what is going to get you to your result that you're saying you want. But if you just want to be generally pretty jacked and you're getting pretty good results training with higher intensities and lower volumes and you enjoy that style of training a lot better than higher volume training, who am I to say that you shouldn't be doing that, okay? Okay. But on paper, I would say a little bit higher volume, lower and lower relative intensity of approach makes more sense. But I also think that scale or 
manipulating your volumes, having lower volume periods, higher volume periods, that makes quite a bit of sense. So I guess my final answer on this is both approaches can work. I lean towards higher volume, lower intensities, but that doesn't mean that I think that the other approach doesn't work. And that doesn't mean that in certain circumstances, I wouldn't use that other approach. If someone enjoyed it a lot more, if they're seeing good results with it, if they're responding well to it, if they have less time every week, then it might make more sense. All right. But I would say that sometimes I think that if people just left a couple of reps in the tank, you'd be surprised how much volume you can get through in a single session because you don't have to rest as long between sets. But that's kind of my answer there, Wes. Hope that helps and kind of answers what you're getting at, all right? Next question is an Instagram question. It basically asks, can you recover from 30 sets per week? I don't know. Can you? <laughs> like, I think that, okay, I'm kind of being an asshole. But my experience is that if you're doing 30 sets for every muscle group every week for one, practically, it's probably going to run into time constraints and it might be very challenging to do that and you might run into your maximum single session effective volume before and just do a bunch of junk volume. Can you work up to 30 sets for a couple of muscle groups per mesocycle and hit that 30 sets in the final weeks? Yeah, I, I definitely think you can do that. And a lot of these studies on volume, they like for your pulling exercise, that will count for biceps and your pushing exercises will count towards triceps. So it's not unreasonable for me to think that most people could recover from 30 sets of triceps and biceps if you consider, hey, that would be if you worked up to 20 sets of back movements and did 10 direct sets for arm for biceps, that's really not that much. Like I think most of my clients probably do that. And I think that you can absolutely recover from that. So maybe for your triceps and biceps, yeah, 30 sets when counting them that way, for sure. But if you're going to try to work up to 30 sets for every single muscle group, and you're going to try to stay there, you might see difficulty recovering from that. And in my experience, it seems as though for the chest, the, for the chest and the quads, I would say 10 to 20 sets, direct sets is a pretty nice sweet spot for most of my clients. For the hamstrings, it seems as though like seven to 15 sets is more of a sweet spot. For the back, it seems as though more so 14 to 28 sets is the sweet spot. For arms, for direct sets for arms, it seems like 8 to 16 sets is kind of a sweet spot. For delts, I would say about 10 to 20 sets is kind of a sweet spot. All right. Anecdotal, but that's kind of what I've seen with clients. That's kind of what I noticed myself. Now, I've had outliers to where I have had some people where it's like I give them 10 sets of chest. And it's like, dude, I am not recovering from this. And these people are still really jacked. It's like they're the high responders might need to work that down a little bit. And I've had people do a lot more. But I would say if you're far above that range, I would really check out your execution, how you're executing each set. Even if you need to, you can send me an email at ryan at revivestronger.com, upload it to Google Drive, send me the link, and I will look at your form. But check on that form, see if each set is actually that effective, and then, hey, maybe you are on the top end of that bell curve or what's good, all right? But I hope that kind of answers the question there. Next question is from Instagram, and it asks, chaining, training chest and triceps on separate days. What do I think about that? Well, I actually do do that. So recently, I have my split is six days per week, training in the morning. Absolutely love it. 
<laughs> part of me wants to go in and just do like on that seventh day, do like calves and abs and stuff like that, just because I feel so much better throughout my day when I go in and lift. But I'll just go on a walk or some shit like that. But yeah, my split is I will do chest and biceps and hamstrings. And then I will do back, triceps, and quads. And I'll alternate those every day. And then I train my delts all six days, and I train my glutes all six days. On three of the days, I train my glutes directly with hip extension. So like the back extension machine is literally all I use because I train at a gym with that's all we got. And I don't want to do hip thrusts because I'm lazy like that. Although that would be a good option. And, and my glutes are already big and I just don't really care that much. The other days I train with the abductor machine where you do the, the little flare your legs out like that. And yes, I feel ridiculous every time I do one of those. And that is kind of how I structure things. And for my delts, I'll do lateral raises on three of the days and then an upright row variation on two of the days. And then on the middle day, I do face pulls. So rear delts. And I really like it. I've been fluctuating back down to near 170. I like to fluctuate between 170 and 180 and just making this body weight look better over time. It's a body weight that I don't feel super chunky at. I could see a little bit of my jaw a lot. I could see sub veins. Like I'm 170, I'm between like 172 and 174 right now. So five pounds heavier than what I am right now, I'm still feeling okay. And five pounds lighter, I'm still feeling good. Not too lean to where I'm noticing symptoms of being too lean. But, oh, my shoulders hurt. But I started this split while I was in a diet. So I want to go through a full gaining phase of like several months of trying to split out, seeing what I see. I train my arms first every single day. I start with either biceps or triceps and I usually superset it with delts. So I'm prioritizing the three most important muscle groups to me this next gaining phase, which are my arms and my delts. I've kind of said this before, but I'm really cool with where my lower body's at. Like, I don't have aspirations of competing. I like how my lower body looks. I think it's fine. Like, I don't have crazy huge lower body. My glutes are, my glutes are strong, but that's really all I care about a whole lot. My hamstrings are good. They grew like crazy. I've been training my legs for like 10 years because when you train for sports like football, you do a lot of squats, a lot of deadlifts, stuff like that. So my legs are pretty well developed. So basically I'm cool with my legs and this next gaining phase, I'm really going to be focusing on arms, delts, and still my chest and back to some extent, but really my upper chest is what I want to focus on. So I'll be doing a lot of inclines and stuff like that, but okay, you've probably heard enough about my split. That's what I'm doing. Ask me again in seven months. I'll let you know what I think about it, but I'm just prioritizing the muscle groups I really want to focus on. I particularly like it to where when I go from training my biceps on one day and then my back the other day, I really don't notice like a decrease in performance in my back because of bicep fatigue or anything like that. And I still get a little bit of a bicep pump on those back days. So I think that could be good for recovery, maybe a slight stimulus and I think that it could be a nice approach. So I personally really like it. And if you're someone that particularly wants to emphasize your upper body, I am I think it's a really good approach. But I'll check back in in about a year from now. If my upper body hasn't grown or shit, then hey, maybe it's a shitty split. But I don't think it is. I think that splits are not the most relevant thing in the world as long as you're training a muscle group two or three times a week, I would lean towards three times a week and you're training with an effective amount of volume. All right, but hope that helps. Final question, client question, recommended supplements, creatine, caffeine, protein powder if needed. But he also asked me about 
vitamin D, vitamin C, fish oil, and stuff like that. So I guess I'll go into that too. So let's start with vitamin D. A lot of people are deficient in vitamin D, especially those that live in a cold environment. I think that I would benefit from probably supplementing with some vitamin D, but I think that the best approach would be to go get your vitamins and minerals kind of checked. I think that you do that at the hospital. Maybe there's like online shit that you can order, but I don't know about that. I've never done it. So I can't really recommend anything in particular, but I think the best approach would be going and seeing what, what vitamins and minerals you're deficient in and then supplementing with those. Like if you're not low in vitamin D, then you don't need to take vitamin D. But if you are, then hey, maybe a good idea. But I think that would be the best approach. But then again, for a lot of people, vitamin D supplementation might be beneficial. What else did I say? Vitamin C, that's actually in a lot of kind of fruits and vegetables and different foods like sweet potatoes, tomatoes, strawberries, oranges, stuff like that. So I think that vitamin C is a little bit easier to get through food, but I think that if it's in like a multivitamin, stuff like that, it's not going to be a big deal if you have a little bit more. Fish oil. A lot of kind of conflicting evidence on this one. There's a lot of there's quite a few studies that say, hey, this is probably beneficial for overall health. But then, like, I think this last summer or maybe summer 2018, there's a Cochrane review that basically came out and said fish oil might have an effect on triglyceride levels, but probably doesn't do a whole lot. And I think that in healthy, lifting, lean populations, is a fish oil going to be that beneficial? I, I don't think a ton, but if you have the finances and it's important to you to theoretically potentially get a benefit out of it, then maybe, but honestly, at this point, I don't think that it's something that I recommend that everybody take. And I think that if you're staying lean, if you're focusing on stress management and sleep and, and when I say lean, I'm talking like under like 20% body fat. I'm not saying like Instagram lean. All right. But lifting weights, exercise and being active, how much of an additional benefit is fish oil going to get? And if your general diet's really good, then I'm just not, sh not sold that it's going to be a huge benefit. Could it be small? Absolutely. Am I going to tell people to stop taking if they are taking it? No. But am I going to tell everybody that they have to take it? Also no. All right, and I think a best approach would probably be to have some fatty fish and stuff like that. But that's kind of where I stand on that, all right? So that's all the questions this week. Drop me down some questions, and I will see you next Sunday.